There's no name like the name of Jesus, no person, no God like him. And the cool thing about our God is that he is madly in love with you. Your heavenly father is crazy about you. Your heavenly father loves to rescue you from messes that you and I get ourselves into. Take a look at what the psalmist says on the side screen along with this graphic. He says, your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. Do you know that about God? I mean, do you really understand that your Heavenly Father's love for you is very great? Do you understand that He specializes in rescuing you? You and I specialize in getting ourselves into messes. But your Heavenly Father specializes in getting you out. But do you also understand that while you and I are getting in and out of messes, maybe the same one for the, like the 2,000th time, that he is still crazy about you? That his love for you has never diminished, even though he's had to rescue you from the same thing time after time after time? Well, if you don't realize how much he loves for you, that he continually loves you, that how important you are to him, and even when you seem to fail him from time to time, it's because the devil will battle against your soulish self. The devil will come against your mind, your will, and your emotions. He's always trying to take over your mind because he knows that if you think down, you're going down. If you think you're not coming out of this mess this time, you're not coming out of this mess this time. If you think there's no hope or there's no future for you, then really there's no hope and there's no future for you. Whatever it is that you think about your situation determines your reality concerning that situation, not the reality of the situation, just yours. However it is that you think about yourself will then determine your reality concerning yourself. It's not reality concerning yourself, but it's yours. The Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, you can conform to your circumstance or situation, or you can transform your circumstance or situation simply by the way that you think. You can take on the shape of your environment and atmosphere, or you can transform the atmosphere that you are in simply by changing the way that you think. So here's the question. What do you think about you? Do you think that maybe you're doing life because of what somebody else had decided, what someone else did to you, the environment you had, the home that you grew up in, the person that you're living with? Do you think your life has settled into whatever it is right now simply because someone else made a decision and you didn't? Do you think they had that much power over you or that much control over you? You see, if you think yourself to be a victim, then you will forever be stuck living out the life of a victim. And if that's the case, then Satan has trapped you. He has caused you to have a very unhealthy soul, a dysfunctional soul, and he has typecast you into a role that as a child of God, you were never called to live out. That's called the victim mentality. Take a look at the side screen. Let me read it to you. The victim mentality is a mentality where a person will not take responsibility. They choose rather to make excuses for why their life is what it is and to find someone or something to blame. When you blame someone, you put responsibility on them and remove it from yourself and leave yourself powerless, resentful, and stuck. This is a way of thinking. It's an internal choice of the heart. So let me ask you a question. Do you know anyone? Now, it's possible that there might be people in this service who suffer from a victim mentality. If so, let me tell you what that looks like. Your life pretty much looks like what it did last year, five years before that, 10 years before that, or 20 before that. You continually repeat the same thing that you've done over and over again. It's kind of like the Groundhog Day Syndrome, where you're living in a negative set of circumstances that never seem to get better. You continually are attracted to, or you attract, the same type of users and abusers you've always attracted in the past. Now, if you would say, okay, pastor, that's not me, man. I'm a child of God filled with the Holy Spirit, and man, I'm stepping forward by faith, doing a life. But you can think of a family member who is living in a victim mentality, constantly blaming somebody else for where they are in life and by the decisions they've made. Now, the cameras aren't on you, so they won't see you over the Internet, but if you have somebody in your family that fits that victim mentality choice, would you raise your hand to kind of represent them? 
Okay, let me talk to them for a moment. If you are watching this message over the internet, if somebody in your family sent you a link to this website or told you how to listen to it on the podcast, it is because they love you and they see something in you that you may not be able to see yourself. They see you repeating the same mistakes over and over again or being stuck at the same place you were when you were 30 or when you were 20 or maybe when you were a teenager. So today, you are going to hear information that your loved one wanted you to have. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. You are about to get unstuck and go into a brand new year of blessings and prosperity and happiness and joy. It's coming your way. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 on the side screen. I want to unpack this passage of Scripture for all of us very slowly. The Bible says, Praise be unto God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of of compassion, and everybody say it together, and the God of all comfort. Not just some comfort, all comfort. Anything you need, whatever mess you get in, whatever situation you find in life, He is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in what? All our troubles. There's not one He can't help you with, so that we can comfort those in what? (coughs) In any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. We do not want you to be uninformed. Now he's trying to tell us, hey, we've been through some stuff. Paul's trying to say, man, I've gone through some issues to where it should have taken me out. He says, I would not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we experience. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we are spared of life itself. We didn't think we were going to make it through what we went through. Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death, but this happened, there was a lesson in it, It happened that we might not rely on ourselves, we rely on ourselves too much, but on God who raises the dead. And then he says, he has delivered us from such an evil peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Now let's say those three bold uh, statements together, and let's let's just say them out loud. He has delivered us, he will deliver us again, He will continue to deliver us. Let's say it again. He has delivered us. He will deliver us again. He will continue to deliver us. Here's the truth. God is the God of all comfort. If you have God, you have comfort. If you don't have God, then you're left to deal with life's pain on your own. And you'll do it like everybody else. You will not get creative and find a new way to do it. You will find an escapism form of sin. You will find an action, a behavior, a habit that will dull the pain, that will cause it to be subside for a little while or will mask it. But God will comfort you. He is the only one who can. He is the only one who will. God will comfort you. And he does this not so that you can continually look for it, so that you continue to look for somebody else who needs to be comforted in the same way. Now, somewhere between you needing to be comforted And having the ability and the passion to comfort somebody else, there is a wilderness where if you're not careful, you can get stuck. And it's being stuck as a victim. If you're not careful, you'll get stuck in this role, and all of a sudden you will begin to look for somebody who will sympathize with you, somebody who will understand you, somebody who will coddle you. Now listen, nobody on this planet is going to do that for you. That's why you continually look for them. Husbands, your wife is not good at coddling you. You can be sick. She will send you out into a rainstorm for a bag of chips. Don't you women clap at that. What's wrong with you? (laughs) Women, have you figured this out? Your husbands are not terrific at comforting you when you need to be comforted. Do you know this? Your teenagers' parents are not going to comfort you when you come home from work. God plays that role. He is the only one who will comfort you. He wants you to turn to him. Now, he will put and commission other people from time to time to come to your life, have a cup of coffee with you, throw an arm around your shoulder, have a cup of, or, or, or just have a talk with you over the phone. He will do that, but it won't last. God is the one who comforts you. That's how he set it up. I... Uh, uh, 
about 14 years ago, was going through a little something where I'd, I'd made a bunch of people mad at me. Now, I don't know how in the world I could have done that because I, uh, I just don't understand how anybody couldn't love me. My mom always loved me. My daddy always loved me. My wife loves me most of the time. So I just felt like everybody should love me. I thought, how could you not love me? I am a hoot, right? But a bunch of people about 14 years ago got mad at me, and, and, and several of them left. And I, you know, and I was just trying to help them, love them. I married their, their family members. I buried their, the members of their family that had died. I've been to the hospital. I held their hands through difficult times. I counseled them, walked through divorces with them, all these kind of things. But several of them just got mad at me, and they started being, like, really mean to me. So I started feeling like a victim. And I talked to Anna about it, and she's like, you know, wouldn't have anything to do with it. She's like, you know, call somebody. So I called a pastor, a friend of mine over in Denver. And the guy's about eight years older than me. And at the time, he's pastoring the largest church in the state of Colorado. He started it as a building contractor out of a little storefront. It grew to another building. And before you knew it, he's running five to 7,000 people in multiple services there in his church in Denver. I mean, he's doing, he's, yeah, yeah, cool. He's just like, whoa, just took off and was doing great. So I thought, well, the guy's older than me. He's probably been through a little bit more than I've been through. So I called him, hey, man, I'm going to be in Denver. You mind if I stop in on you? He said, Hooper, come on by, buddy. So I come by, I go back in his office. He's sitting behind the, you know, the big desk with the big chair, and I'm sitting out here in the little desk, little chair where I'm not used to sitting. I, I'm used to being the one that helps people, not the one there to be helped. So I'm sitting in this little uncomfortable chair. He says, man, what's going on with you? And I said, been a tough year. Preacher, I said, look, man, I said, some people got mad at me, and they're saying all kind of bad things about me, and they don't like me anymore, and I went from hero to zero, and people left that I thought we'd see Jesus together one of these days. You know, I, I mean, I just, they're, they're people being mean. And he looked at me, and a big old grin came over his face, and he just started going, <laughs> and I thought, man, God is really not giving you the gift of compassion, has he? Because I was there sitting in a victim chair to be a victim, you know, and he, he wouldn't have any of it. And then he said, well, let me tell you what happened to me when I was your age. I said, what's that? He said, the church was growing, things were going crazy, man. I mean, everything was going wonderful. He said, my wife married me. I was a building contractor. She never wanted to be married to a pastor. Church took off, began to grow, and I put the church ahead of our marriage. So it's my fault. I know that. But she didn't feel like she could compete. So when the church is doing great in public, our home was imploding in private. He said, I came home a couple of weeks before Christmas, and everything in our house was gone. She had backed up a truck, had some help. And there wasn't any furniture, no bedding, no towel left in the bathroom. So the only thing that was left in the house were my clothes and my side of the closet and a few personal items that were left on the counter in the bathroom. In my 40s, I went home to my mom and dad and spent that whole Christmas season at home with my mom and dad while pastoring the largest church in this state. And I looked at him and I thought, do you want to sit in this chair? But I realized we couldn't both get in the same chair. But isn't that what happens when a victim marries another victim? Both of you are fighting over the same chair at home. Well, you know you can't expect much out of me. You know the abuse that I came from. My parents didn't treat me right. My daddy never showed me any love. And the husband's going, well, you know that my dad was an alcoholic. He was never around. And everybody's fighting for the same chair. Get out of the chair. You don't need a victim chair in your home any longer. I remember what this pastor said to me that day because I was feeling pretty stupid even showing up there after his story. He said, you need to let God redefine you. You need to let God redefine you because all those haters out there, you can't give them that right. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know who you are? I mean, after everybody else said what they said and everybody else thinks what they think and all the dust clears. Do you really know who you are? Galatians 4 tells us, Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. He said, And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Look at verse 4. Think of it this way. If your father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they what? Say it. Even though they actually own everything that their father has. Now think about that for a moment. Let me ask you a question. 
Do you think you right now have everything as a child of God that your Father has given you? Do you think you have it right now? Anybody? What's the answer? No. Why not? If you're his child and he's already given it to you, the only reason you don't have it is because you're not what? You're not a grown-up? Are you telling me at 40 you still hadn't grown up? Are you telling me at 50 you're not grown up yet? The Bible says you're a child of God. He's given it to you. Why don't you have it? Because you're not grown up yet. Do you think it might be smart to grow up while you're growing up? How do we know? What do we got to do? The Apostle Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, When I was a child, he said, I spoke and thought and reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, he said, I put away childish things. Paul, how do you know you're grown up and you can handle the things God wants you to have? When I grew up, what would you do? I put away childish things. Ah, I was a child. I became a man by putting away childish things. Put away childish things. Start receiving as an heir at whatever physical age everything God has for you. Have you received everything God has for you to this day? No, you have not. What do you got to do to get it? You got to grow up. Here we go. What do you do? Three elements. Change the way you speak. Change the way you think. Change the way you reason. And when you do this, you begin to receive what the Father has already given you as His child. And it all begins with changing the words that are coming out of your mouth. What you talk about reveals your growth. And what are you talking about? Are you talking about actually going somewhere in life? Are you talking about actually taking on the challenges, building a great family, investing in the future, thinking about the things that you're going to do for the kingdom work of God? Are you still talking about what some idiot did to you 20 years ago? Are you still talking about how that person mistreated you or what that person said about you or this ex-wife or ex-husband said that you would never amount to? Are you still rehearsing those things? Because every time you repeat what the enemy said, you are rehearsing and locking in and holding yourself in place with the words that are coming out of your mouth. Well, that person was mean to me, and I don't know why they, you sound like a middle school girl. No offense, middle school girls. I did not trying to, but seriously, you're texting it, and you're talking about it, and you're sending it out in email. Stop it. It is showing your immaturity. Do not repeat what the enemy said. The enemy has no right over you to claim who you are. You've got to change the way that you think. Someone may have broke your heart. Someone may have betrayed you. Somebody might have said that they would have been with you forever. Then all of a sudden there was somebody else. Somebody said that they were your friend and while you were down and having coffee with them, all of a sudden your life gets going better. You start passing them up on the scale of blessings. They start talking bad about you behind your back. And now all of a sudden your heart's broken because somebody lied to you and betrayed you. And all of a sudden you know, you're, 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 you're sad because you thought you had a friendship that wasn't really real. Can I tell you what I have learned after 56 years on this earth? I don't know where I got this, but this is great wisdom. Players are going to play, 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 play. <laughs> Haters are going to hate, 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 hate. You got to shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. I don't know where I got that, but that's that's. That's good wisdom. Start changing the words that are coming out of your mouth. The blessings of God are on my life. 2015 is going to be a year of abundance. Our home is a blessed home. The presence of God fills this place. There's nothing that I can't accomplish without God. With God, all things are possible. Start talking about where you are going and thanking God for the road that he used to get you there. And stop talking poor and broke and pitiful and disgusted in the economy. And start talking about partnering with God financially and taking your whole life and everyone near you to a whole other level of prosperity and blessing. 
And it all begins with the words that are coming out of your mouth. You cannot talk like a middle school girl and have grown adult blessings in your family. You can't. Well, the church, the church, all they ever talk about is money. That, would you quit being stupid? You sound like a child when you say that. That's the same nonsense you were spewing when you came into a church and you're now 20 years later still saying the same thing. Grow up. The words that are coming out of your mouth are holding you back. I, uh, about a year ago, we had a woman that came to our church. She'd been coming to our church since back at North Avenue, so several, several years she'd been coming. And I have noticed that no matter where she got, she took a negative attitude with her. And um, she was just, oh, spewing out all kind of negative business. We never did anything right. Another thing could have been better. That could have been done this way. She never did anything. She just sat on the sideline and just criticized everybody that was doing something. And so finally she was in one of the departments here, and uh, uh, the department head just mentioned to me that her negativism was affecting the people that were around her on Sunday morning service. So I said, well, you know what, let me talk to her. I've known her very well for a long time. So I caught her after the service was over, and I said, let me, let me share something. Well, first of all, I love you. You know that. You've been sitting under our teaching for a long time. And I said, let me, let me just tell you that I don't think you've grown one inch in all the years you've been here. You still talk the exact same way you talked when I first met you. You still think the same way, and you still reason the same way. Matter of fact, I'm not sure you've grown at all. I said, but here's what I'm not going to allow you to do anymore. I'm not going to allow you to infect any area of our church in a negative way because of the negative stuff you spew out of your mouth. So either you change your attitude or shut up. That's what I told her. That's what I told her. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of people that play victims that do not want you to move them out of their victim role. They're looking for somebody else to coddle them, somebody else to fix them, somebody else to give them a support system around the way that they think. Now, do you think she received that from me? No. No, yeah. I just became one more mean person in her life who is a cause for the problems that she has. Now, that's back a year ago when I was a senior pastor. Now I'm grandpa pastor. Now I'm a lot nicer than that. I don't do that anymore. I pass out candy, hug people's necks. I don't have to say that to people. Anymore. I'm so much nicer now as a grandpa pastor than I used to be, but a victim many times when you confront them and their victim mentality, do not want to move out of it because it means they're going to have to change some stuff. And the first thing they're going to have to change are the words that are coming out of your mouth. I'm not saying that you hadn't been hurt. I'm not saying you hadn't gone through things. Please, we've all gone through things. All of us can stand up here and tell a story. We can all tell a heartbreak. We can all dial 1-800-C-R-Y-B-A-B-Y. And there is nobody on the other end of that phone that's going to fix your problem. Nobody. They will take advantage of using you and abusing you and make money off of you being a victim, but they are not going to fix you. And if they would, you would have already found them and every one of us would have got them on the phone. They don't exist, so shut it up. Nobody in this life is going to coddle you. I don't want to be the one that needs help anyway. God said, come to me, I'll comfort you, and then you go comfort a whole bunch of other people with any kind of problem they have. I want to be the person on the side of the desk that's fixing the problem, not the person that's sitting in the victim chair with the problem. And the only way you can do that is take it to God. Well, Pastor, these people said this, and these people said that, and they hurt my feelings, and I don't know what you do. And that, that was a painful thing that person said about me. I can't get that out of my head, out of my ears. Look at this verse. Let God be true. And say it, every, would you read that again? Let God be true and, wouldn't it be nice if you had a healthy enough soul to where when somebody was saying something negative about you in your face, you could look them right back in their face and go, <laughs> liar. Wouldn't that be great? Rather than going home crying about it, I can't believe what they said. Just liar. Lies coming out of your face. Wouldn't that be so much healthier if your teenagers could do that at school? <laughs> Liar! Instead of crying about it, writing it on Facebook and it. And, oh my gosh. The enemy just wants you to have an unhealthy soul, mind, will, and emotions. Let God define who you are, He's the one that knows. 
That's why it's so important that you have time with him where you're meeting with him and letting him define, let him break through the lies and tell you the truth. I wish there was a time, just one time in every day where you could possibly meet with your heavenly father and have him take away all the lies and renew who you really are and and remind you how good you is and how much he loves you. I wish there was, I, I don't know when that could happen. Here's what's true. Here's something that is true. Listen, you are where you are right now in life as a result of your decisions. Not your mama's fault. Stop that. Stop it. Not your daddy's fault. Well, you don't know my dad. I don't don't care to know your daddy. Doesn't make any difference. When you were a child, your life was about the results of somebody else's choices. But when you became an adult, you can never use that excuse again. Let me, say, let me say it this way. When you became an adult, you can never use that excuse again. Never. <laughs> Two sons <clears throat> went to a funeral service with their dad. Their dad had been an alcoholic and an abuser, user all his life. And... Uh, after the funeral was over, they don't ever, they talked about it. They never remember the time their dad was nice, caring, put into them, showed them a great work ethic. Never remember too many nights when he was sober. He was always mean. One of the sons, a couple of years later, became an alcoholic himself. He said uh, to a friend or anyone that will listen, you know, my dad was an alcoholic. He abused us, abused my mom, never had a relationship that worked. Never home, never taught us anything, never showed his love. So it looked like I was destined to be this. I mean, what could you expect? I'm an alcoholic because my dad was an alcoholic. It's the best I could do with the life I've been dealt. The other son was climbing the corporate ladder, promotion after promotion. And one day after work when he was receiving a party for another yet promotion. Alcohol was everywhere and people drinking shots and stuff. And he had a Coke walking around with it. And somebody said, hey, man, we've got an open bar. It's free. Just go up here and help yourself. And the guy said, well, maybe you don't know. My dad was an alcoholic when I was growing up, and I will never be an alcoholic. Decision. I want you to see this on the side screen. No one can change your past, but you can refuse to live out your past in your future. We've all come from rough, rough backgrounds. All of us. Let me get you that picture one more time. I, I love this graphic. I, I hope it, I hope, can you see it? you understand what it is? Don't you love the story of Simon Peter when he was getting out of the boat? And he said, he said, Lord, can I walk on water to you? And Jesus said, come on. And he was heading toward Jesus. He took his eyes off the Lord, looked at the water, the situation, the circumstances. And began to sink. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand, grabbed hold of Simon Peter, walked with him arm in arm back into the boat. I don't know what sinks you. It could be a marriage. You feel like you're sinking. The economy, you feel like you're sinking. Could be a decision you made totally on you. Stupid. You feel like you're sinking. You feel like you can't compete. You can't stay up. You don't know what's going to happen. Sad, down, depressed, memories. And Jesus reaches his hand down right in the middle of your mess. Because your heavenly Father is crazy about you. He loves to rescue you. He's had to do it so many times, I know. And every time his love never diminishes toward you. Would you bow your heads with me for a second? It's time for some of you to receive healing and help, comfort. Start receiving like an heir what God has already given you. 
you've got to grow up. You've got to start speaking differently, thinking differently, and reasoning differently. You are not a victim of what someone else has said about you, what someone else has done to you, how someone betrayed you, that business partner, that person, that individual. None of it matters. It doesn't matter. You're a child of God. Speak it, think it, and reason differently, and you live differently. And you can start doing that today. You screwed up, you screwed up. Somebody did something wrong to you, well, big deal. They're a fallen human being, and they made a mistake, and they hurt you in the process. Quit rehearsing it, quit repeating it. And go after what God has given you. Now, this is a whole lot more than what you would have got with them. If you feel like you have been held back because you've thought that it's somebody else's fault and you're ready to get rid of that victim mentality, would you raise your hand? Okay, cool. If you have a loved one who desperately needs the comfort of God so they can get off that groundhog day syndrome merry-go-round and you want to pray for them, would you raise your hand? Father, it is in the powerful name of Jesus we come to you, thanking you for your love and your goodness. We're your children. <laughs> We're your children. And nobody can stop us from living the life you want us to live. No matter what they've said, no matter what they've done, no matter how bad we've hurt, we tuck into you as the God of all comfort. You comfort us, and we start looking around for somebody else who's sitting in a victim chair. We might help them out of it with your comfort as well. And God, I pray you bless our people. Meet every need that they have. Change lives. Get us unstuck, I pray. And never typecast into a role because of an unhealthy soul that's been attacked by Satan. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. Because you are our Heavenly Father. And you are crazy about us. Amen. See you Christmas Eve, guys. God bless you. Bye-bye.